Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-host Ann Fernald and I welcome you to the Twice Over podcast, because to teach is to learn twice over. In this episode, Speaking for the Trees, we are joined by Stephen Stahl, professor of history at Fordham University and the author of Rampalo, the Ordeal of Appalachia, who shares his thoughts about the environment and teaching authentically online. Stephen, thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. My pleasure. And I think you're one of the first people we've asked on because we wanted to talk to you about your research and ideas you might have and kind of expertise you might have as an historian in thinking about what it feels like to have the conditions of your labor shift under you so drastically as it has for all of us who are professors. And I'm wondering if you can reflect a little, if you've reflected on that at all and what you've been thinking about, what it means to be a professor and how that changes when we're all doing it, you know, in the super mediated way. I think everybody derives a great deal of identity from the work that they do. It, it should, you should do that. I'm writing an essay on Marx's uh, notion of human nature, species being, right? And the right. whole essence of species being or species essence is that what you do rolls out of you. It's an expression of you purely, and it's not you know, taken from you. We don't have to talk about capitalism, but I think that we derive a lot of identity as we should from work that is extremely authentic to us. And that's what we're very fortunate to be able to do that and to say that our work is authentic, meaning that it comes kind of genuinely out of, out of us and is an expression of us. And I, when it comes to research, I, I, you know, most of us do that by ourselves anyway. It can mean going to conferences and it can mean going to archives, but what's really changing here is of course teaching and, and our identities as teachers. And I know you've talked about that, you know, extensively with, with other guests. That is the, the big difference as I've experienced it. And that is part of the way I see myself as a professor is that I am in some sense improving the world. I'm taking away a lot of the misconceptions that my students have about things. And that that's a very personal process. And it's something that I do in person and I, and I take it very seriously and I have a lot of energy for it. Doing it online is like doing it behind a curtain. I don't know, it's like being on a treadmill it, rather than running outside and in, in being in the air. And so it, it takes away the immediacy of it and it makes me wonder, am I actually teaching? Right, right. Am, How I, am I actually doing what I did before? And if I'm not, that that is a crisis for me. How do we know that teaching is happening? I mean, how did you know in your old classroom, what were the clues that you were looking for when you would give a lecture or um, lead a discussion? And how, are you finding ways to read those signs uh, in this environment? I taught a little while ago and not everybody has the same kind of internet connection. And sometimes the students can be, the picture can be frozen Yes. That terrifies me because <laughs> I don't know if they're really there. And sometimes it's just their name, you know, maybe they didn't get dressed for the situation, you know, and so it's just their name. I, I don't even know who or I'm talking to. So that I, I don't like that at all, because to answer your question, uh, I, I'm kind of a performer. And um, but part of any good performance is that you are aware of your audience and you feed off of them and I can see them respond and I can see them react. And I always tell them, interrupt me, ask questions in the middle. If I lose my place, it's my problem. I want you to ask the question that occurs to you so that it can be as interactive as possible because of course, lecturing is not interactive, really. Right. You, it's so much more difficult to sense that there is an audience there. Right. It's more difficult to do it. But I did it today. In fact, I lectured today on Earth Day the history of Earth Day, the uses of Earth Day, the planning of it, and kind of the deep background of where it came from. So I, I did that. I wanted to do it live. I do everything synchronously. I don't understand asynchronous. That is to me, that's saying you're on your own. No, I want to meet with them and do it in real time. So 
that that's very important for me to feel like I'm still a professor. In this current moment, is it more important that I can manipulate the conferencing technology or that I that I know my subject and communicate it well? What's more important right now? I could be the greatest professor in the world, whatever that means, but if I can't run Zoom, I'm useless. I, I want to use the technology to to do as much as possible what I did in the classroom and it won't be adequate, but at least I will feel like I'm kind of fighting this situation and not and not giving into it. The real tragedy is, is to say, well, you know, there is, a, there is a certain way of teaching online and we all have to learn how to do it and it requires all of this asynchronous stuff and we have to give up the individual meetings. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to basically fight it and, uh, and keep the teaching piece. I'm going to, to teach synchronously in, in, in the sense that I'm going to insist that we behave as a seminar, that we behave as students together, and, and not to change my syllabus. And um, I completely agree with you. I don't know how exactly we do it through the flat screen, but one thing that I do like to say to my students is that this is not adequate, that we're doing the best we can under the circumstances, that our project is extremely important, and that we, and that we have to kind of fight through it to, you know, together, that we're trying to hold together as a class. I've had students drift away and I've gone after them and said, are you okay? What's going on with you? Are you all right? I thought, oh, this person is just kind of ignoring the class only to find out there's a mental health, you know, crisis going on. And, uh, and I could respond to it and say, give me what you have, whatever you have right now, give to me. If you take the final, you'll pass the class. And, and she was just like, thank you so much. You know, she was afraid to, to come to me with that. Don't just try not to let the technology and the distance, uh, don't think the worst of our students, think the best of them and, and go after them. A as you might, if a student didn't show up to your class, you'd send an email. It's really not any different in that way. It's just that this curtain makes it so that we seem more far apart. I'm trying to resist that, but I have to say, you know, it's really, it's hard. There, I have students, I have a student in France. I have students, I'm sure, in Indonesia. I've got someone in Nigeria. I mentioned a movie that we saw with someone walking through a market in Nigeria, in Lagos, mm -hmm. and how much I enjoyed that part of the film, and I thought it was fascinating. She said, I'm in Lagos. And I said, oh, <laughs> well, so is that right? <laughs> so um, I didn't know. Um, That's amazing. So how do you, how do you, you, know, how do, you do this um, like that? But it, I have to be honest, it, it scares me that we would have a hybrid system or that we would be fully online in the fall. I'm, to, be on, to be personal, I'm actually really afraid for my, my college student uh, children. Um, I, I'm, that disturbs me more than anything else. Can Is you that, talk a little bit more about why that disturbs you? No, it, just, it really scares me. Well, because, because nobody, we, the students don't go to college just to learn from us. They go to they go because they play ultimate frisbee. They go because they're in there, because they're in drama. I have a, a daughter at the Rhode Island School of Design. You can't put that online. She's a painter, and she has to be in a studio. What do you do? But even my son, who's at um, Franklin and Marshall College in uh, in Pennsylvania, you know, he has he's that's it's a whole community there. It's not just a matter putting it online for them is just like saying college is just about learning, and that's how we focus on it. But it's not. It's a whole community, and it's an entire world and living for them. And it's it, it's sports, and it's socializing, and it's writing for the newspaper and and meetings, and that's taken away. And um, I'm really disturbed that he that he wouldn't have that experience that he's had one semester so far. So I, I would have to get over it. Obviously, that's when I would really grieve. That's when my grieving would would begin. I can accept this so far. You have a month left, it, the, the spring break was part of it. I can rationalize March and April, but I, I couldn't rationalize September and, and on. That would be very hard for me. I'm wondering if how your Earth Day lecture, this is, we're recording this on the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day. And I'm wondering if your Earth Day lecture, the content of it shifted in light of the pandemic or in light of giving that lecture online. And if you could talk a little bit about, in terms of the information that you shared with your students. Well, I showed a cartoon that said, the air is so much cleaner, there's less garbage everywhere. And then, you know, the earth is, there's people speaking on the earth. And then one says, 
it, does, it takes a pandemic in order to slow down the economy. And this is a great example of the, of the constant mismatch and conflict between a sustainable environment and what we call you know, a, a vibrant or active economy, how they're, they're a fatally at odds in, in that cartoon. So I did, I definitely brought that in. But what I was really trying to, to convey to the students was this different time when the environmental problems were much more, they weren't so much easier to solve, but they had clearer solutions. You know, you clean up a river, you, you put a monitoring, uh, something to monitor the, the sulfur dioxide coming out of a smokestack. It was kind of low hanging fruit in the sense that it was so bad that uh, legislation could have an immediate effect and it's much more complicated now. But you know, one of the things that I did I read to them the Lorax, Dr. Seuss's The Lorax, <laughs> published in 1971, right after Earth Day. I read them the Lorax, and I said, we have to deconstruct this. What is going on? At the end of the Lorax, the Wunzler holed up in, his, in his, uh, the remnants of his factory. This boy comes from like, I don't know, like a suburban development nearby in this post-apocalyptic, you know, kind of night of the living dead landscape. And he looks up there, and the Wunzler, who you only see his arms, he throws out two seeds of a truffle tree. He throws them out. He basically says, look, kid, you can replant the forest. Here are two seeds that I saved. And it's like this little boy is me. First of all, it's me when I'm five years old. So I said to the students, I said, who do you think has the responsibility here for regenerating the world? The Wunzler or this little boy who now has the only two seeds, the genetic information of the truffle plant in his pocket. Is it his responsibility? Where does responsibility lie? And also the Lorax just disappears. Where exactly does he go? He lifts himself like Mohammed being lifted up into heaven or something. So that was 1971, so I, we did that and, and then kind of talked about what happened to Earth Day. First of all, it was a centrist protest. There were 20 million people who turned out. There were all kinds of speeches. No one had seen an event like that before. So it was an outpouring of, of interest and concern across a broad spectrum. And I think that broad spectrum is, is, uh, is narrower now, though of course nothing is more important than the climate. So in some ways it's understandable that Earth Day has lost the energy that it had when no one had seen anything like it before. What do you see about what happens after the crisis? What I find so fascinating is how we've adapted to it so quickly. If I would have told you in January that this was going to happen, that we'd be having this kind of, you'd say that is crazy. It's like right up until something becomes a reality, we deny that it could possibly happen. That unfortunately says something about the climate crisis too. Because what people have been saying now for decades is it's, it's so difficult to act on something that could be so disastrous, but in the short term, you don't actually see its effect, even if it's actually growing and it's actually happening. So the bad news is that uh, when it becomes that kind of a crisis, and I, I can't exactly tell you, I mean, in some places, I think it's already happening. I think that we would be able to respond to it. I, I wonder if we had a president who said fossil fuel consumption has to end and that we have to shut down the economy and go through this transition. It would be incredibly unpopular to be a lot of resistance to it. But we're actually seeing that kind of thing happen right now, that it can, in fact, be done. I, I find that remarkable. What do you make of the resistance that people are protests around yeah. opening the bowling alleys and tattoo parlors? The social observer and more subtle person in me says, well, of course they're scared. Of course they're angry, of course they're upset. It's entirely understandable that they would have these feelings. But the thing is that what is essential is that the nation state has to be the entity that moves in, stands and stands in between them and their actions and says, here is what you need, here is the money that you need, that it has the leadership and the resources to say that we're going to take care of people in a time of crisis and you don't have to be scared. And that's what is fatally missing in this, is that only the state can stand in and do this. And I know that many of them are, are, have great, great suspicion and distrust of the state itself. I understand that. But if it really moved in and was able to take care of them and to relieve their anxiety, I think it would go a long way 
to doing that. But we have something that is really half-assed right now. It is not adequate. So that I understand, I really do understand them, but um, I think that it's a failure in leadership. You know, the United States geared up to fight World War II in about 18 months, went from really almost having no military to having a military and also turned over all industrial production into war production in something like 18 months. People are willing to mobilize, but you need, you need a shared vision of it. You need to explain why it is. You, people are willing to go through sacrifices. Look at the medical workers. It really all, I used to think that the president was really not that important. You know, I, I actually don't believe that anymore. I think that that kind of vision does start at the top. And if you listen to FDR and you listen to some of his fireside chats and his speeches, they are utterly riveting. And they can motivate people and they do make a difference. So the fact that we're in this crisis with nothing like that at all, I think actually is a, is a larger factor than I once believed. As you know, I'm a big fan of your work and your book, Ramp Paulo. And well, it's the truth. It's a wonderful, wonderful study of life in Appalachia. And early on, as the pandemic was spreading, I think West Virginia was maybe the last state to even have a case. And I'm wondering if you're, and I saw a t-shirt of a map of West Virginia that said social distancing since exactly. 1743 <laughs> or something. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought about the people who live in the region that you studied. I mean, I know that your work goes far back in time, but extends up to the pretty near yeah. recent past. If you've thought about how rural America and in particular broader Appalachia is kind of dealing with this crisis. And uh, they're, they're not safe from it. I, I'm in touch with people from the, the region. They're, yeah, then some of those people are, are very worried because uh, if it does, when it does, it has begun to spread there. And when it does, even if the numbers will be, uh, the proportion of people infected will be nowhere near the, a place as dense as New York City, they, they really lack the medical infrastructure and the resources to deal with it. And there's also many health issues among people who live there. Right. So that something like the death rate could be much higher there than in other places. So it is, it is quite worrisome. It is quite worrisome. Uh, they're not, they're not, uh, yes, there is a lot of social distancing. Yes, people live in hollows, but they still gather in community centers and in churches and, uh, and, and they can gather, um, even if there's only really two kind of major cities. Can you talk a little bit about, in a rural context, what the special public health dangers might be for people or what you imagine them to be? Well, I... Uh, like you said, as you opened it, you know, like uh, social distancing. Oh, in other words, farming. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, uh, they definitely have that. And people who live in hollows, there's a lot of space. And so in that sense, they're fine. And, and, they're, and it, they're in a better situation. But there's a lot of people who have endured chemical exposure, black lung, smoking, um, things like diabetes and uh, that make them a more vulnerable population should they, should they come into contact. Their rate of infection is not going to be like it is in, in, in Bronx and, and, in, the, and in Queens. It, that, it's not going to be. No. It's just that proportionally they could, they could fare much worse and their hospitals are, are, are just not adequate. It, it, you know, it's, I don't know how many ventilators are in the state of West Virginia. I wouldn't be shocked to find out there was a thousand. Um, in, in the entire state or, or even, you know, fewer. So that's their special circumstances that they have county hospitals and they're inadequately staffed. Doctors don't, doctors don't go to medical school to become doctors in, in West Virginia. Even though West Virginia University has a first rate medical center, you get there by being flown by helicopter, even nearby, because you really can't draw a straight line on the ground. It takes hours to go what it would take us I-95, you know, a couple of minutes. It's a whole different world. So the helicopter, the, the helipad is how people get help there. Wow. Well, how can you do that with a, over the entire state when there's a pandemic? You can't. So mm -hmm. people are going to be sick in their houses and they may not ever get to a hospital. 
that can really help them. That's the fear. I don't like to use the word isolation because no one is really isolated in the sense that they don't know where to go or there's no road to take them there. But they can be socially isolated and, and feel like there's no one to help them and feel quite isolated from, from where the help is. Right. And that's, what, that's what's disturbing about the region. I want to pivot a little bit to thinking back about Fordham students for a few minutes. Okay. Um, as you think about your students, what in your estimation do our students need most right now as we are finishing up this spring semester? They, they need to know that we're there for them and that they're not alone and that the university is, a, is not behaving right now as an actual community, but that it continues to be a viable community in some sense. That even though they are in their homes, maybe far away, that there is a context in which they, they still matter as students. That's what they need. They have their own issues, their own problems, their own support networks. I think many of them are not in distress. But if we are um, an exemplary community, which is how I like to think of any university in the ideal, then they need to know that hasn't gone away. I like to tell them the professors are talking, you know, there's like a faculty meeting and we talk to each other, we're in touch with you. There's a, there's a faculty committee on what to do next year. There are people who are dealing with it. Even though I'm not all that active in these things, um, I, I'm, it's very important to me that these things exist. And, and I do contribute somewhat. I want them to know that we are behaving as a community and we take it seriously that they're not uh, alone. I don't know how they feel if they're just, I don't want them just to go and drift away. It's not good for us. It's not good for them. It'd be terrible for Fordham. So I, I think that's what they most need. They don't need me to be really easy on them. I am certainly understanding. And I think that my grading is, is definitely lighter than it was. It's not really that. It's, it's more that we, uh, we're trying to understand and deal with the situation and, and we understand um, we're willing to listen to what they're going through. Can you talk a little bit about why knowing history and studying history is important? I have found that I have been saying a lot to family members about the plague of Justinian, the Black Death, the Amerindian disaster. I have been talking about disease in history. It's part of environmental history. I actually teach this stuff. Um, and people have written about it, I've seen, you know, like in the Times, they have. I don't know exactly where all of this points. Some of it is, it's just unbelievably grisly. It's just unbelievably dark. I, I guess, you know, human communities do, they do get through these things. That we are the way we are as humans, undoubtedly because of moments of severe crisis that require cooperation. I think it's fairly understood that there was a, uh, a volcanic eruption 77,500 years ago that almost wiped out all human beings. There may have been a thousand female individuals. We know that because of mitochondria DNA. And that the only reason those people survived was that they were able to work together and that their brains worked in a way that maybe the other humans didn't. So uh, we can survive these things, but it does require that we don't see ourselves as kind of everyone for themselves uh, is not the way to behave. And I think the disease outbreaks actually demonstrate that in certain instances, though it's sketchy, I, I admit. So it, it doesn't really point in, in one direction. Communities can, can survive these things. As you think about this crisis and think about yourself as a, as a professor, during this crisis, are there teachers from your past that you've been returning to in memory to think about, oh. Right. Jack Kurtenbach. May his memory be for a blessing. Jack Kurtenbach, who taught me a class called Humanities at Millican High School in 1983-84. I wrote uh, an essay on Siddhartha. I thought I was so smart. I thought I was so smart. <laughs> said Dartha, and he, uh, he was one of the first people to die in the AIDS epidemic. Oh. In fact, it was so early that no one would even say that it was AIDS. We knew that it was. I just loved him. He was so humane himself, and he, 
he made he he taught me what it was like to to read and think about something how a book could matter to you how it was okay that it mattered to you how you could write something and say something about it you didn't need to be a, an expert that you could you you could you had a right to think about something and say something about it yourself a work like Siddhartha, which to me it it it, it was Shakespeare or Aristotle right it was like it, this was high culture and i read this and and i realized that i could understand it he mattered a lot to me and he was one of the people who made me who i am jack curtainbach uh -huh. yeah in long beach california it was a real pleasure thank, thank you very much twice over podcast is available on soundcloud stitcher and spotify with new episodes appearing twice each week for host and guest bios and show notes, please visit our website, TwiceOverPodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at TwiceOver1 or email us at TwiceOverPodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.